Uh, so yes, as it says up there, I'm uh, uh, it's spelt Kenneth, but I'm actually called Kenny, although uh, everything in writing tends to be Kenneth. Um, I'm from Edinburgh University in the Central um, Information Services in the uh, Unix team there. And uh, we're about to be merged in with our Windows colleagues who run Active Directory. Um, so uh, that's going to be an interesting time for us to see how many barriers we can um, bring down and so on. So this talk I gave about a year ago, we've got an annual Unix day, we call it, in Edinburgh, where computing officers from all around, because about half the IT in Edinburgh is done centrally and half outside in schools and units and so on. And we have a day when we, get, we gather together. And in fact, uh, the three talks from Edinburgh University here were all given at that event. We, we do it about a fortnight before this one to give people practice run-throughs. Although my practice run-through was a year and a bit ago. So bear with me if I've forgotten half of this. So this is uh, what Kerberos means to most of our users. This is a cosine web login uh, instance. And they put in their university username, they put in their university password, and they get to access stuff. And that's, that's the end of the story as far as users are concerned. But you're not users. Are there any sysadmins in today? <laughs> yeah, good, I'm in the right room. So I thought we'd drill down a little bit and uh, have a journey to the center of the protocol. Um, this uh, story was set in Edinburgh University, actually. Um, it was a professor of geology from Edinburgh that Jules Verne wrote about. So we're using Kerberos. We're allowed to use that word. It doesn't really show up on the front page for the, uh, end, u uh, the end users. Um, Kerberos, a very modern thing, obviously. This is very Web 2.0, isn't it? It's got a search thing that maybe isn't even powered by Google. I don't know. And we use MIT Kerberos. Um, and we have been for many years. Um, that's another very modern, exciting looking, gripping, compelling web page. Um, but it tells IT people like us that m that must be the real story. But does anybody want to go any deeper? Please say yes. Yes, good. <laughs> OK, so a particular version of Kerberos, MIT Kerberos, we're using. And again, this web page has obviously been a bit more development done on this. It's a bit more exciting. It's got colors and things on it. Um, and it leads you down to uh, the documentation. And it has a search and an index and feedback as well. That's good. But we could go further. For those of you who are Vim fans, apologies, that's Emacs. Um, it's a bit of the C code, the source code of Kerberos. When things are going wrong, when you don't understand stuff, when it's not behaving as the documentation says it should be. You can always go and have a look at that. We're open source people, of course. That's the benefit. Sometimes that's not deep enough. Sometimes you want to see what's happening on the network. And Wireshark is really your friend for diagnosing faults or just having a little play and seeing what happens. Because not everything tells you everything that's happening out there on the wire. Um, so there is a, the line highlighted there says there's a pre-auth required, which we'll see in the, in the walkthrough later on. But sometimes that's not even deep enough. That's just the same packet, but just the bytes. And for those of you from Edinburgh University, you might recognize the highlighted number. That's one of our IP, IP addresses from our old Novell Network days, that's a number ingrained in our heads. <clears throat> so in my experiences of um, having to uh, explain, or not explain, I don't have to explain anything to my colleagues, but I have to have conversations with them uh, about their use of Kerberos and what they might want to see out of it, and how, we, how they could implement um, Kerberized servers and, and so on. And uh, it came apparent that a lot of terms were used just interchangeably as in any IT field they, they, they normally are. So there, there'll be some people here who already kind of are familiar with all the terms of Kerberos. Uh, who, who thinks they are? Right. Generally speaking, it's actually only people who run the Kerberized KDCs, the, the, the services, who are comfortable with them. So I thought a little glossary here might be helpful. So principle. I should put a question mark on the end of that. What's a principle? Well, 
It's not an account. It's uh, an account has lots of stuff in it. It tells you your UID, tells you the f your full name, might tell you what group you're in. It uh, might have a, a home directory location, things like that. What shell you want to use. There's another principle. That's the principle of Edinburgh University, Sir Tim O'Shea. It's not that. I was going to put a big X through it, but I thought maybe that's a bit disrespectful. <laughs> no, no. So, of course, like everyone else, I went to Wikipedia and got a definition of principle. So I'll let you just read that. Okay. So we can think of it just as, if you like, a username, although don't think of it as a username, because user, there are things that aren't users that have principles. But it's just a little string. It's a, it's a name. And uh, it can be tied to a password. You can think of it as a password, although it's not a password. This is why everybody uses these terms interchangeably. So there's a, a principle, an example of a principle. So each bit is called a component, and that's fine. And Kerberos 5 introduced the forward slash separating components on the left-hand side of the at sign. And usually on this side is the realm that your um, Kerberos instance is uh, managing. <coughs> and normally we would say there's a primary component and an instance component that's optional, and then the realm component. It's, I don't know whether it's convention or hardwired that it has to be an uppercase, but everybody puts it in uppercase. It's a bit like I was in the SQL talk um, a little while ago, and the convention was all the statements in uppercase. In Kerberos, realms are always in uppercase. And there's some other principles. So this is the one that people confuse for email addresses. Whoever thought it was a good idea to have their principal name and their email address is almost the same and should be shot. Um, here's another one. This is a service principle. So the primary bit is host, which means you're, this is a host type service. And the next bit, custard, uh, means this is an instance of a host, which is the fully qualified domain name of something. It doesn't exist. Don't start pinging it. And then realm is the name of the realm. Our realm is quite a long name, so I didn't want to pollute the slides with that. This is another completely valid Kerberos one. It looks a bit like said, um, but it's not. That's just another valid one. It's up to the applications who, which make use of Kerberos to put in place standards or conventions to what they expect the form of these principles to be. Kerberos itself doesn't care how many of these components there are, although we might have to go back to the C code and look to see what the maximum is. As an aside, it doesn't even really care what the um, encoding of it is. It is just a stream of bytes. So these are some other ones. Uh, which one of these would anybody think of using? Or does it matter? Nobody knows. The top one because it's, it's sensitive. All right. Um, it is. Well, the KDC itself isn't case sensitive, but convention says that everything would use that one. It's one of the few where, this, where the primary, the service name, if you like, is an uppercase. So if, if you use that one, then you're Apache and you're, um, you can configure things, but then you can't configure everybody's browser to suddenly start using the wrong one. Well, KDC is case sensitive. Um, the, KD, the KDC is case sensitive, yes. Oh, it might not be for principles. I'm not sure on that one, actually. It's case sensitive, but it doesn't care which case you use. Yeah. Case preserving, but not sense. Yeah. So, um, and these are, by convention, um, real users can be given a second, if you like, a second password. But of course, you have to have a label for it, and that's where the word principle comes from again. So this is no, generally known as an admin principle. It's just convention to have the word admin there. You put in your access control lists all around all your services, any principles you like. So, um, but all the documentation out there in Google land on the interweb will tell you use admin. It's less surprising. But we 
and the university would quite like to be able to do this to separate out admins from different departments. Um, and that, again, is valid, but it's not conventional. So here's a, another couple. Um, these are valid as well, even though you've got the realm on both sides there and the realm and another realm in that. So you, your KDC can have principles for foreign realms. Because remember, principles are just names. They're not really special. They're special to things that use them. Oh, that's a rogue slide. That was them all together sort of thing, just to show there's a wide variety of them. Keys. You can think of the key as the password, although for normal users, they're derived from password. And it's the key that's stored along with the, the which encryption type it was uh, derived from. And keys are stored in the KDC, has a copy of the keys. And key tabs on your servers or clients, they have keys as well. So the clues in the name key tab, it just has keys in it. And you can think of these as, because you can think of these as passwords, equivalents, protect that file on your server as you would a file with a plain text password to a service. Tickets. Tickets are the things that get passed about to prove your identity, and they're short-lived, and we'll see later on what they are. So a ticket is something you're handed out when you authenticate, and then you get other ones, and then that's the thing that makes Kerberos work. Tickets are stored in ticket tab, anybody? No, in the C cache or credential cache. And that's normally a file. It, uh, traditionally, it's been a file in TIMP, owned by whoever it was who authenticated. Uh, in modern operating systems, it tends to be in kernel space, so using the kernel key ring um, infrastructure. The KDC is the key distribution center. That K doesn't stand for Kerberos, annoyingly. Everybody thinks it does. Everybody thinks it's the Kerberos key. No, wait a minute, it's only one key. Um, and it runs two separate services that you need never think of as separate, except of this slide. So there's AS is the authentication service. I think it just checks your password. And then there's a ticket granting service, which grants you tickets. And KDCs live in a realm. So the KDC is the the, ser the Kerberos server. Just think of it as the Kerberos server. At Edinburgh, our um, realm is called Ease, uh, which leads to lots of uh, interesting host names. Um, uh, Protease, Striptease, <laughs> Atease. We used to have Putatease and Illatease and things like that. It's great fun. Naming things is always the time-consuming bit. Um, so yes, yeah, Edinburgh, Easy. Uh, no, Edinburgh Authentication Service, I think it's ease. And we have about half a million principles in it. So it's quite a big thing. 4,000 of them, that's less than 1%, but still a big number, aren't anything to do with people. So these are the service principles for things like web servers, well, every Linux host that want, you want to use Kerberized SSH on, needs one, and so on. And between our KDCs, we are issuing about a million tickets a day. So again, this is something that we don't want to um, uh, play about with too much. This is a genuine production type thing. And when I joined um, the team a couple of years ago, I, I used to work in another team. Um, called Desktop Services, and I did manage desktops of Linux and Macs. And I gave a talk, I think, three years ago when we were in Edinburgh about that. So since then, I've jumped ship, and I've forgotten about Windows stuff, and I've learned about some Kerberos stuff. And the first task I was asked to do was learn Kerberos and upgrade our um, KDC Kerberos infrastructure. Um, for the following reasons, we had old hardware. We had old encryption types, you know, like ROT13, almost. <laughs> um, we had uh, no real policy on what happens to password failures. Um, well, nothing happened in password failures. You didn't get in. Um, we didn't have any delegated service principle management. We didn't have anything 
fancy on the front. People used to have to email us and say, I want a principal for my SSH server. And then we would go and do something manually on the KDC and then get it back to them securely somehow and so on. That's time consuming. We did have incremental re uh, replication or propagation from the master to the slaves. And, uh, but that was implemented as a very old patch to a very old version of NLT Kerberos. The patch didn't work anymore. and We needed to go forward, so but that was still a requirement for us. So we went with MIT Kerberos. We were already using it, so in theory it was a drop-in replacement. We didn't need to um, re-engineer a lot of our um, systems. It now supports incremental propagation, which was a plus. Um, there had been some time a few years ago when it was thought that Heimdall really was the thing that was pushing forward, but um, more recently uh, the MIT stuff has been pushing forward. And it's the native implementation on uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and derivatives, therefore, uh, which is what, where we are. So it should be a drop. If we want to run the latest version of MIT Kerberos, it should also drop in nicely into there. So some of the problems we've had with that, though, it's a single master. We're running it that way because we're using this built-in database rather than an LDAP um, backend. We're getting propagation issues. Uh, we were quite surprised. We got these half a million principles in the database and three password policies. So not very much data in the database for them. But if you change uh, a principle, add a new principle, change a password or whatever like that, then only that bit gets propagated down to the slaves and it's really efficient and it's fantastic. If you change a password policy, then the entire database has to be dumped, shipped over the network and loaded up on the slaves again. So that's not great. Uh, that took us by surprise. And then dump issues as well. We use a configuration management system and we said, oh, all you KDCs, you all just dump your databases every night for backup purposes. Do it at, say, I don't know, half past nine at night or one o'clock in the morning. And then we found our monitoring system said, Kerberos is unavailable. That, that's a surprise. Turns out when it's writing, if it has to write back to, as it's dumping, it's got a lock on it and everything stops. And it takes about 50 seconds to dump our database because it's so large. And I'm sure the developers don't have ready access on their test infrastructure to such large databases. So they, they claim to have fixed this, uh, but we're still seeing it. Um, so I need to get to the bottom of that. But we worked around it by just telling them to all dump at different times, and that's fine. Um, we, open LDAP allows you to do proper multi-master because it's the LDAP that's doing all the replication for you. But however, it doesn't have, or it will have shortly, but at the time and now, it doesn't have password history. So you can't say, no, you can't change your password to that because you've used it in the past. And also, we just felt that was maybe too big a change to all do it once. And the next time, we'll definitely look at L LDAP backend again. Um, we might go back and review. Maybe, maybe Heimdall has done some other things that have got compelling features. We don't know. Free IPA is where Red Hat are putting a lot of effort into MIT Kerberos now, because that's what they use for free IPA. And maybe even just not, not do it separately. Who knows? There's politics involved in that. I'm not advocating either way. But would Active Directory just do this for us anyway? That'll be a question our senior management will ask. So we want to do devolved principal, um, service principal management, allowing a school admin to manage any principals only in their school, to separate them out from other schools. And that's a tiny bit of code, a patch that I've got that fits into the authorization bit of K at the Kerberos admin daemon. Um, they kind of half accepted that when I pushed it upstream. They said, yeah, that works, but we're not like it. It would be better if it did it, everything in a better way. But this is such a small patch, it applies cleanly. And it will continue to apply cleanly until they replace it with a proper authorization model. And then we won't need the patch anymore. So that's good. Um, what we do is, instead of just delegating down to computing officers in schools, we would prefer to delegate all the way down to the hosts to do their own self-management of principles. So what we do actually is every host that's registered into the service gets a host client principle for itself. This is, you know, think of this as the fully qualified domain name. 
And then it manages, except not deleting, because that's a bit dangerous, anything, any principle for itself. This is the back reference um, um, format. So we've got a little wrapper that um, instead of asking you your username and password several times, it only asks it once, and then uses GSS API to go and do the registration. And then the host can run this itself. So this is, in effect, the password of that host client one, and it will get the host name. The host um, principal can get an LDAP principal, put it in a different file. And of course, all that can be scripted then. And we do this in LCFG, which is our configuration management. Think of this as like Puppet. So we're just telling it, get a host one and get an LDAP one, please, in a different file with a different user ID set. Now, if you come away from this talk with one thing in your head, just remember that thing exists, trace, KRB5 trace. It's not very easily discoverable in the documentation, but it will save you um, many hours of Wireshark and so on, like that, We're trying to work out what's going on. You can still use Wireshark, KList, KVNO allows you just to go and grab a service principle and look at it, and DNS needs to be working, so otherwise Kerberos just doesn't play. So I said it was um, pushing on. Um, there's an in Internet Engineering Task Force group, the Common Authentication Technology Next Generation, CAT NG, and of course we all know what the next generation of cats are. Every talk has to have a kitten on the internet. And that is to show it really is called a kitten. And that's what they do. So you can just see they do set GSS API, SASL, Kerberos, extensions, improvements, and so on like that. So you, you can subscribe to that mailing list if it's quite low traffic. So we're going to do our Kerberos walkthrough now. This is my son uh, with his friend trying to navigate through the beautiful beaches of Edinburgh. Um, and we're going to attempt to do a bit of our Kerberos walkthrough here as well. So the first thing we need to do is provision these keys or set passwords. So if I can ask for my service, which is Mark, providing the Kerberos Mark service. And Matthew, who's going to be our guinea pig volunteer, to come down. I'm going to give you each. That's uh, one of them. Oh, no, what I'm going to do is just give you the keys first, I think. Now, that's the KDC's copy. That's your key. OK, put that in your key tab and keep it safe. Off you go. Yeah, and the user key, client's user key. That's your password, yeah? yeah. Okay, we both okay. agree on that. I've got a copy. Okay, so Matthew is wanting to access a service provided by Mark, and I'm going to play the KDC here. Um, he's going to have to discover what realm he's in and where I am. So first of all, he looks in etcetrakrb5.conf on the box, and it says, you're in my realm. And it could either say, and I'm over here at this IP address or this host name, or it could say, just ask DNS, in which case it would just look up this service record for me. So um, can I have a network volunteer, Donald? New carry, first request. He's, he's used DNS, and he's uh, given it to UDP port. <laughs> yeah. Supposedly. That doesn't happen in the real world, does it? Yeah. OK. Can we get another network um, stack? Can we do the TCP one? Much more reliable one here. You've got to. Okay, I think we need more bandwidth and less latency. <laughs> OK, so I've, I've received a message now saying, oh, please send by return a ticket granting ticket so I can access all the wonderful services which trust your judgment. Oh, who's this from? You can tell me the IP address that it might have been from. You really trust me, though. Uh, no, I don't trust you. So I have. Can you send us back? on the way. Nope. 
You can, actually, yes. My records indicate that he needs to authenticate. My records indicate I must ask you to prove to me that you're you. Please return the current time encrypted with your secret key. OK. So you should have in envelope P a pen, a bit of paper, and write the current time on it. <laughs> you don't need microsecond resolution in this uh, uh, example. Okay, and now you're going to. Oh, you need this. Sorry, I forgot. You need this magic bit. Remember, these padlocks are just encryption algorithms. So I can have the same, I obviously have the same libraries as he's got. Yes, sir. Can I read this? You can't, can you? That's you right. OK. Now I've got a copy of that key that was derived from his password. So I can open this. That was KRB5. So this is the message I've received. Fourteen forty-five. It's within five minutes that I'm configured to accept. That's where the, that's why time is critical in Kerberos. So I'm going. I'm happy with that. And I'm going to send two messages back to him. First is the client's ticket to granting service session key. So a new key. I'm going to magic out of somewhere. Just a random one. And I'm going to send him one. And here it is. In here. And I'm going to encrypt it using the secret key of him. So in other words, his password. You can hold on to that for a second. Don't take it yet. And uh, an informational message, which also has a ticket granting ticket in it. Now, this is going to be the ticket. Just to show you all, it's a real ticket. <laughs> it's got some information on that. And I'm also going to send him the client's ticket granting service session key. Or has he already got that? Oh, that's what I put in there. Secret key. Ah, yes, that's in the wrong envelope. Well, he's going to, no, he's going to be able to open that. No, nope, but he shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on, it's all right. It's only my copy I need to put in here. Uh, I'm losing keys. <laughs> you can't hold that, after all. So we've got the names mixed up on the two labels, but it's the same key. It's the ticket granting service session key. Goes in the ticket granting ticket, and then that gets locked with my key for this ticket granting ticket. Is this one? It's like Fifty Shades of Grey, this, isn't it? <laughs> Not that I've seen the film. I've seen the news. There we go. So that goes off to Matthew. You can open one of them, can't you? So the ticket granting ticket, you can't open. You don't know what's inside that. It's just a opaque blob of encrypted data. Does it have some paper in it as well? No, okay. Well, basically it said, here's a ticket granting ticket. 
and it's got a, a new key. That's the session key. Yeah. yeah, TGS session key. You keep that. Right. OK, so now the client, he's got everything to be able to send these two messages back to me. So the uh, one of them is the ticket granting ticket you're just going to send back as well. OK, and the other one it needs the current timestamp. C has the ticket ticket. Does, it, does D have a bit of paper that says what to do? D. So you have to write that on. It's 1531. 1451 even. <laughs> 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 Daylight savings kicks in. TGS session key. Yeah, the one I just sent you. So the little padlock. And you've kept that key, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the network can bring these two things back to me. C and D. OK. Right, I know how to open one of those things. It's the ticket granting ticket. So I can open this because I've still got the key. And inside it should be aha, the session key that I put in there to begin with, and he hasn't been able to fool about with this. So now I can use that one to open this one. Great. So now I've got everything to send these things. So I'm the ticket granting service, remember? It says 1451, that looks about right to me still. And we're going to send message E, so I need to look for an envelope with E on it. And this is going to thank him for requesting a ticket for Mark, Mark's service. And I managed to verify his identity because he sent back the ticket granting ticket to me and encrypted the other envelope with the key that was inside that that I knew you couldn't open. So I'm going to send you another key which you should encrypt when you're talking to Mark with. <coughs> so that's the not that one. It's this one. This is F, isn't it? We're up to F. Yeah, good. And this one is encrypted. So that's the other key. There's a padlock and key in there for talking to Mark, but it's going to be encrypted with the key we've already been talking to each other with, which is that one that you just sent back to me. This has to go back inside the ticket granting ticket. For safekeeping. Okay, so ready? Mm -hmm. Just buffer these up for me another second. F, and we need the envelope marked E. Ah, e. Sending the other session key. Yeah, okay, so that's the. All three? That all goes to Matthew now. Wire speed away. So again, you should be able to open some of these and not others. Okay. He says, thank you for your request for a ticket to the service server. 
please say, I managed to verify your identity using the contest certificate granted ticket and so attach the requested service ticket for your convenience. I am also sending you another session key which you should encrypt, which you should encrypt your communication with the service server. Right, so that's ticket granting ticket. I'll open that one. Yeah. That one. But you should keep that in case you want another service. Yeah. And then I've got the six round session, which you gave me the key for earlier. So yeah. That one. <laughs> that contains and the service server session key. Okay. So now, finally. I can kind of relax my KDC role because I've done my bit. And now it's over to the client is going to have to send Mark something, which is, uh, well, that says message E. That should be F, is it? No. Oh, message E. It's the same thing. So the ticket that I gave you for Mark, yeah. you're going to send, but also another message G. So you have an envelope with G on it. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm sending a timestamp to the server. Thank you, please. Okay, the 1457, please. Yeah. Three minutes left. No pressure. <laughs> He's not even <coughs> reached Mark's fabulous service yet. Mark, what kind of service are you providing today? It's the 19th service. The 19th service is the last one, so wait a minute. Reproducibility, that's what we like. Is your, net, your network you believe more sugar? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm encrypting my message with the service session. Yeah, so two session keys. Session keys. There's one for talking to me and one for talking to Mark. That panel, thank you. Oh, they both go in. You probably should put that one in there. Which padlock is that? That's the two client <laughs> session. <laughs> No, you don't. Keep that one. You can keep that one. Right. So that's E and G to the, to the server, please. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Okay, so now Mark has yeah, received yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's an easy job up until then. Mm. Oh. Mm. I've got this, which means I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the ticket? The one with ticket written on. Is there an envelope with ticket written on? There's an envelope with E and an envelope with G. Right, the envelope with ticket is over here. In the bottom of the pile, no doubt. What were you PC? Ticket! I found it! Yes. I forgot to send you the ticket. And I pray it's got key inside. Yeah, phew. It's the other the other key, the copy of the one that you encrypted that one with. So let's rewind back time like we've been doing. There's the ticket, thank you. <laughs> that actually came in that packet as well. That's the ticket for your service. Now, one of these things you should be able to open. I need to be nervous as well. You can do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dear, dear user, I have thank you for your request for a ticket for the server server, I need. I am pleased to say I managed to verify your identity using the contents of your ticket granting ticket and so attach the requested service ticket for your convenience. Note that I am also sending well, you another session key that was my message to encrypt your communication with the service server. Okay. Your sincerely, ticket granting service. Yeah, that was me. It should have been me. Yeah. Too many bits of paper in this. Yeah, you, can see, you can see implementing this in real life with physical things that you touch is quite hard. Doing it in C or you know, re-implementing it yourself in code. A bit of a nightmare. <coughs> ticket. The ticket. You can open the ticket. I lock the ticket and Mark can open the ticket. The user never sees inside any tickets. Right. A ticket? The ticket. Right. And you're going to send him back a message. Of course, because Matthew could have just kept copies of anything that's been sent to him. So he would have all these tickets, copies in the credential cache. Here. 
Do you use your name? Uh, uh, the incremental time is tick 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 tick. Check the HTTP servers, point to the morning or HTTP servers. No, 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 the incremental time. So you take the time that was written on the bit of paper that he sent you. Um, no, what you have to do is. <laughs> you've now got a key for this because it was inside the ticket. There's a key in there. Too many keys, too many encryption types. And now you can open that one, and that should have the, the time that Matthew wrote on it in there. Service server. The current time is 1457. Please reply with the incremented time similarly. Okay, so the other bit of paper. H. So what was it? It was 1457. So 1458. Not the current time. Not the current time. Just whatever he sent with one added and then re encrypted. <laughs> it's, so it can't just be reflected straight back to the same packet. It's got to change the innards of it and re encrypt it again. Re encrypt it with that one. No, no, no. We can pretend he's got a copy of the ticket in this case. And you will have remembered what the time was when you wrote it. Okay, so at the moment, Mark is happy that Matthew really is Matthew. <coughs> and the reason why this packet is going to go back to Matthew is for Matthew now to decide whether he really trusts that this is Mark or not. So the, Matthew should still have a key to open that padlock. Yeah. And he's going to work out, is that just one minute longer than it was when he sent it? Yeah, that's all good. Yep. Great, so you're happy that Mark is Mark as well. So you've mutually authenticated, and um, the world is a happy place. And so the, we're getting very near the end here now. So um, the client or the user never decrypts any tickets. They're just things that just get passed around. Only the KDC has the key for the ticket granting ticket. That's that one. There's only one copy of that key. I didn't, when I provisioned my KDC, I created one copy of this and didn't give it to anyone else. That's a very sensitive bit of information. Um, apart from us provisioning Mark with a key in his key tab and me having the same copy in my KDC, during service, Mark never spoke to me and I never spoke to Mark. That's another thing. So when you're debugging Kerberize problems, don't worry if the service can talk to the KDC. They don't. The session keys, the little um, yellow padlocks and smaller keys, they were just created at random by me, the KDC, and issued with inside tickets that had limited lifespan. So these are kind of throwaway humoral, they're called short-lived keys. And the principal keys, the ones tied to a username or the service name, they were long-lived keys because at the very beginning of this, we agreed what they would be and everybody kept them safe. So Matthew kept the password safe in his head and Mark kept his key in his key tab with uh, file permissions to make sure everybody else could read it. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Time. We have ten minutes or so questions. Question for me. Right, sorry. Uh, yeah, just going going back way back to the start to how you uh, how you delegate services. Where where you give a machine in a in a school, like uh, it was a local machine, wasn't it? A prefix to manage their own principles. Yes. Are they? 
Is there a separate provision, provisioning for students, or is that for local user accounts, or what would be what stops no, someone who? It's only so that just think of it as servers. Okay, so a server gets its own special principle that says this thing has got rights to create other service principles that are tied to you yourself, the machine, the server. Right. Oh, so it's only for service principles. It's only for servers, it's not for users. See. My question is going to be, uh, is the next generation of kernels going to get any simpler? <laughs> <laughs> or is it, just, is it mathematically as simple as it can be? I suspect it's probably uh, as simple as it can be to make sure that you, you have this capability of the server that we're going to talk to, and, and mutual authentication and, and so on. A lot of the work that's going on is other things that could be inside these tickets. So Active Directory, famously, when Windows came out with that in 2000 or whenever, um, they put a big binary blob inside that, which en encoded all the group memberships we had before the pack. And uh, it took a long time for the open source community to reverse engineer that, and then it was locked up a bubble. But Microsoft have since opened up that. And one of the standards that's going forward is to standardize a more general way of putting that kind of information, authorizing information in. Um, and also things like the different encryption types of these padlocks that we were passing around. Over time, these padlocks get rusty and don't work very well, and people can use cheap hacksaws to get into them. And things. So uh, uh, they keep changing these and registering new ones and testing them as well. Is there support for two-factor authentication? Uh, that's going in as well, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of talk about that, that kind of thing. Um, often what Kerberos would provide you with one factor, yep. and then your, your authentication stack would require another one at the same time. So you didn't have that What do you mean by password? Uh, sorry. slide in just before this last one and I'll send it so it's going to be available yeah. next month. And I'll put it in a slide with a few links to some of the things. Thank you very much. And uh, a small gift to uh, York Confectionary for the new and network team. Thank you.